Welcome to Unleashed at Work and Home, the show dedicated to helping veterinarians, vet techs, dog trainers, shelter and rescue workers, pet sitters, and all the other animal crazy pet professionals manage their stress and find more joy. I'm your host, Colleen Pilar, and I'm thrilled you're here with us today. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on your favorite app so that you won't miss a single episode. This episode is brought to you by our free community, the Circle of Resilient and Thriving Pet Professionals. If you like the ideas shared here, then you're invited to continue the conversation with other lifelong learners in the community. You can find out more at ColleenPilar.com. It's the perfect place for you to learn cool stuff, feel good, and take action to create the life you love. Come join us. My guest today is Colin Funkhauser, who is a co-owner of Funky Bunch Pet Care and the host of the Pet Sitter Confessional Podcast. Thanks for joining me today, Colin. Hey, Colleen, super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm interested to talk to you because a podcast about pet sitters is a pretty specific niche, says the person who has a podcast about pet pros with compassion fatigue. So we both definitely do the specific niche thing. But what inspired you to create a podcast for pet sitters? Sure. So coming up on, oh gosh, like f- almost four years ago, about three years ago, my wife and I were wanting to do something new and fun uh, together that we could do. And, and we don't really consider ourselves creative people. Uh, but um, I've been listening to podcasts for a decade or more at this point, And I have subscribed to hundreds of them. And we just wanted to tell our stories and talk about what it was like to be pet sitters. And originally, it started out just going to be Megan and I sharing some advice, and some of our funny stories. But then we had people starting to reach out wanting to be interviewed about their time as pet sitters. And that really changed it for us because all of a sudden it clicked of going, this is something where people can contribute to a community where they can help have a voice in things that they've learned. And that was that's really important to us that everybody have an ability to to share their experiences and to help other people. There's something really powerful about that community aspect, isn't there? Where where the multiple voices sharing a thought or an experience that can normalize things for people, make people feel seen and heard and understood and and valued in a way that sometimes isn't happening with friends and family who don't really understand the job. Yeah, they don't understand it. Or you're in the community and you just kind of see the same talking heads over and over, year after year. They're the same speakers at the conferences. They're the same people writing books. They're the same people doing all this stuff. They have a really valuable information to share. But when you start hearing the same thing or slightly different takes or how somebody else applied it in their unique situation, it really does open up the possibilities to really start going, wow, I'm I'm really not alone. I'm not because I've listened to you know, all these people or I'm in this Facebook group that and they're all saying they're struggling the same thing. I thought it was just me. Mm-hmm. And that really takes this this very small world that we live in. As pet sitters, we don't talk to people throughout the day. I know many people enjoy that and they have their own strengths that they pull from. But a lot of people forget or don't realize how much that interpersonal reaction means to them. And then they lose that. And then they're just going day to day, sun up to sun down, having not spoken a word to a single person. And then they don't know, who do I talk to? How do I work through this? Is anybody else feeling like this right now? Because it sure doesn't feel like it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's a that's a really important thing. And and there is something really magic about hearing a variety of voices and then figuring out what is right for you. And that that is going to be different for all of us, but it doesn't sound that way when you're hearing people lecture about it. You know, often it's like, here's the way to do the whatever. And for any of those things, whatever it is, just pick the subject for whatever it is, you're going to have to modify it to find what's right for you. And so with your show and you talking to so many different people about their own experiences, it it helps people see more the patterns and vibrancy of that, that you are going to have to take information and try it on, wiggle around in it and see, how do I make the best of this work for me? And what parts should I just let go? 
It, you, it really is. And, and one of the things that I like to do is when I'm interviewing people, I, I actually like to ask some of the same questions over and over and over again to people because what it does is it it helps me, A, I mean, it, this really helps me a lot. Like, I'm not, let's not detract, <laughs> detract from the fact that talking <laughs> to other people is very beneficial and therapeutic to me. But also, I want listeners to get like, hey, look, I'm going to ask them, how was their time getting into pet care? What was that like? What sparked that interest? What was that first moment like? Tell me about your first client. Because it starts building this familiarity and they start going, oh my gosh, it's like, I know this person because I felt like that or I've done that or, oh, they did this thing when I was thinking about this other thing. And it really helps us get to think about, I hear some information and it's hard to do that though, Colleen, right? Like when we were really busy to hear new information and then go, okay, how do I apply it to me? Mm -hmm. It's much easier to just passively let it come in and out and go, okay, I learned something, but now I have to apply it. That's a whole other thing. Yes. It is. There's a great quote, and I might miss say it. The aim of education is not knowledge, but action. I believe that is the accurate quote. And in the show notes, I'll attribute it properly. But what I love about that quote is, I think for decades, I pursued knowledge but I didn't take action. I was I was like waiting for more knowledge. I when I hit the right level of knowledge, then I'll be ready for action. And the reality is. For all of us, all of the time, the goal of education is action. Like we need to be thinking about what am I going to do with this? How am I going to use this? And what you said about taking information in passively, and then it just kind of floats through. We feel like we learned something. But if we didn't change in some way, then did we? Did we really? And that's certainly something I've struggled with a lot over my life. Same. I, I'm a hoarder of information and data and things and papers and books. And I just like having all this stuff. And I've really had to start working on going, okay, but did this change me in some mm -hmm. way? Right. Maybe I learned another thing that I don't like, or maybe I learned something that I would never want to do, or maybe I learned something that I was doing wrong and being open about that. But that really takes having, having time and space in your day to do that. Because when you're just going from, you know, for, for pet sitters and dog walkers from visit to visit to visit to visit to visit to visit, to visit for 12 hours straight, you don't have time for that. And I think a lot of that, what we, we, we talk a lot about this is encouraging people to value that time and space and go, okay, find that separation in your day, even if it's five minutes. And so you have that and start building that throughout your day. And that's something that I know I've struggled with. I help our staff in figuring out how you can have time and space in your day uh, because it's something that is so essential to longevity in the business and longevity and creativity and adaptability and being able to change to things that if you don't have that in there, but you don't value it until you need it. And then when you right. need it, sometimes it's too late. Yeah. And it's, it's a skill and a practice that you have to, it's not going to just happen that I happen to find time and that I happen to use that time effectively. You have to say like, I'm going to make time every day, even if it's just a little to have some of those moments of reflection. And some days it's going to feel like it wasn't all that helpful. And other days you're going to have the big aha. And yeah. over time you'll recognize that it's the practice of doing it that that helps you do that. It is, it is. And I've, I've, I say a lot to a lot of people, like if you are feeling like your business is down and you're not making a lot of sales, the fastest way to book up solid is to try and take a weekend off. <laughs> or try and set, right? If you really want to juice your sales and be busy, try and try and mark off a couple days and tell people you can't take visits. You'll you'll be <laughs> you'll, you'll be booked to the gills. <laughs> so one of the questions I like to ask people is is a journey question. Like, how did you become a pet sitter? And for you, it's a whole family affair. You and your wife are, are co owners in this business. So tell me, how did that happen? Like, go back and give us the trail. Sure. So it's kind of crazy to think about as of right now, it's we're going to be coming up on 11 years having mm -hmm. to done this. And my wife and I, we got married and then we moved out to from Missouri, moved out to Lubbock, Texas to go to Texas Tech University for our graduate degrees. So I have a master's in natural resource management. Megan's is in environmental toxicology. The running joke in our marriage at the time was she kills things. I try and keep them alive. That's the balance <laughs> that we have. It's not a good joke to make to people who you're trying to convince to take care of your pets. But, <laughs> um, and we, as graduate students, you don't make a whole lot of money. And we had just gone through some financial classes and we're learning kind of how to put a life together. 
And they really recommended try and find a side hustle, try and do something on the side. Um, my idea was to do an aquarium cleaning business because I was an aquarist with um, the Bass Pro Shops uh, mm-hmm. and I worked at their flagship store in Springfield, Missouri. So I thought, oh, I'll set up and maintain aquarium. Megan had this idea to do dog walking and pet sitting. Um, I won't tell you which one was more successful, but uh, I never cleaned a fish tank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, it's it just stuck. And we, we pet sat in Lubbock. We moved. We continued to pet sit. We moved to back to Missouri. We continued to pet sit. And then we went into it both full time eventually. And it was something that at the time, you know, one of those decisions going, oh, this is probably an inconsequential thing. It will, won't impact me for the rest of my life. Um, but what it really was is what I, I'm reflecting on that, realizing what are we actually doing? Like we're actually helping people at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And that was something that really, really, that, that I connected with on a very deep level of going, the pets are wonderful. I love taking care of the pets. They're, they're a lot of fun. But it's the people that I get to see the joy on their face yeah. and the peace of mind that they are given. That's what feeds me and keeps me going uh, and that I've really been able to connect with over the years. So it's interesting to think back and going, what, the why at the beginning was I need to make extra money and how the why has now changed over the years. And now it's it's something that's much deeper to to connect with that, that is really fueling me. Sure, the money is fine. Like, that's good. Like, we need to be paid for services and, and that that's okay. It's not a bad thing. But having this other connection, I think, really t- ties it in a lot more to keep going through the the really hard times. Yeah. And I think that's an important piece. I had the luxury for many, many years of not using professional pet sitters because I lived near family. And so there was always someone who could help out. And I moved this year where that's not an option. And so I just got back from a week away and it made such a big difference to me to know that my animals were being cared for by the same pet sitter that they'd had once before. Like there was a level of comfort in me that I felt for this trip that I didn't have for the previous one because the first visit was Alan's first visit and the well, first several days. And then the second was, oh, Alan's coming back. He and I have had only a few conversations, but I felt better. It was big, a big impact for me knowing Alan is with Abby and Colby. And he made comments about them to me that made me go, they're behaving as themselves. Like my cat was, (laughs) he was expressing how chatty my cat was. And I was like, "Mm -hmm, yep, good. She's fine. (laughs) (laughs) It, it, It is. And I think that's at the end of the day. Uh, pet sitting is a people business. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when we lose sight of that, we lose sight of the relationships that we're building. We're losing sight of the fact that people are coming to us with fears, anxieties, um, previous mm-hmm. interactions. They have a history with these things. And, and we just try to treat them like a blank slate and only focus on the animals. And again, that, that is ultimate. Like we, we, we do need to be focusing on the pets, but we say we provide peace of mind through the top, the, the highest quality pet care. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's a means to an end of, I need to make this person feel good. And I do that by executing my job well. Yeah. And your point about how people are bringing with all of their stress and baggage from a variety of other areas, it really matters because that is true for all pet professionals is that they get into the work because they care so much about caring for the animals and they intellectually recognize that the people are a part of it. For many of them, the people are a driving force. And for others, it's sort of like, no, I'm really here for the pets, but the people are a piece of it. But it's easy to lose track of how much anxiety there is on the part of a client trusting someone in any role, veterinary, pet sitting, training, to do right by their pet whom they adore. And people are pretty depleted and stressed these days. So sometimes that doesn't come out as politely or professionally as we might like for our clients to discuss it, but we're all dealing with that. We we are, you know, when, when 70% of pet owners would delay medical intervention in their own life to provide medical intervention in the life of their pet, they might get kind of terse with me when something doesn't go the way they thought would would go. Mm-hmm. And that first step before you ever react or respond to something that you get feedback on, that that pause, right? And go, what is why is this person doing this? What what could else be going on? And just taking that the few brief moments to empathize with them and try and get to that point before you respond. 
not that you have to do it every time or not that that's absolutely essential, but I do think every every now and then touching back with, man, this person's really coming at me over this. I, what do you mean? I just missed one feeding or I just mm-hmm. missed one thing. And and going, oh, well, this is their everything. Yeah. You know, this this is all that they have right now. This this maybe maybe this is a widow who had her cat through the death of her husband and that's the only reason she didn't break down 11 years ago mm-hmm. is because she had this kitten. And that's her only connection to the past. Of course she's going to be a passionate about this. And we, that is I believe that's part of our responsibility to take that into account of how we approach, we talk, we interact, we send updates. We, we that that is so important to that process. Yeah, it really is. And it is amazing how many people have a story like you just shared about the woman with her cat. That's far more common than we realize, you know, that, that there's emotional ties that make this particular case even more fraught. We have a client who, whose son um, died of a drug overdose many years ago, and she still has his dog. Mm-hmm. That that dog is her son's dog. Yeah, and yet she allows us. She gives us that opportunity, that that honor of taking care of that dog while we're while she's away. Mm-hmm. That if that if that doesn't change how you approach that situation, I don't I don't know else how to talk about that because that that was, and she didn't even bring it up. We found out through t- some t- tangential information and some other conversations with her, and it was like, okay. I see why you're stressed. I understand. This is this is your one connection that you still have. Uh, and I'm going to I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful and so important. Yeah. And actually fairly common. I've had I've had several clients with similar situations. And when when they share that information, it's like an honor. It's a, there's a trust there. Like that they are telling you something that's so important. Yeah. I feel overwhelmed. Well, they're vulnerable at that point too. And again, all this relates back to it's a people business. And Mm -hmm. I know know 11 (laughs) years ago, I did not get into pet sitting to help somebody grieve the loss of a son through the care of their pet. (laughs) <laughs> that was not that was not in my manual, Colleen. I don't know about you, but I've never that was not in my, any of my training, uh, and yet that's what we get to do. And that's a phrase I've been trying to use a lot more in my life. Of I get to do this, yeah. As you said, this is an honor to do, and that really helps change my perspective and shapes how I view and interact with others around me. Yeah, it it is. It's really powerful, and the I get to do phrasing is super helpful to look at how we're approaching the tasks that we've chosen for our careers. Yeah, it it, it is at the end of the day, just going, this is some, and and this is something that I chose to do. I chose to be involved in. It gives us some, also gives us some back, some agency of control over situations and realizing where that ends and where that starts. That's with me, right? Mm -hmm. I decided that this was something that we are going to take on. I get to do that because that was my choice. And now we can start helping set up some other healthy boundaries through that same mindset as well. Yeah. That relates to a conversation I was having having recently. What we can control, what we can influence, and and what's just completely out of it. And that what we can control is typically very, very small. And the areas that we can influence, much larger, but we can't control them. So there comes a point where we have to say, like, I did what I could, and that was enough. Like, I had to show up within my values and do the actions I could do, but I can't control the outcome here. And, and recognize those pieces. But one of the things that we can control is I chose this profession. Yeah. And I can choose differently if it's no longer right for me. But if it's still right for me, I get to do this. And that's really key of going, if it's still right for me, because I mm-hmm. think sometimes when we say, well, I chose this, so I have to live with my consequences, right? We can go down that road of like, well, right? And it's this kind of, it's that sunk cost fallacy of like, mm-hmm. well, here I am. This is this is all me, and it can take, definitely take that negative slide. But again, the, the the immediate next question is: Is this still something I want to do? Yeah. Is this still there? Still is there still joy to be found here? And and 
go through that question tree and to find out where you're going to end up on that journey. And that's so critical of, of realizing that. And sometimes that takes having good friends around you, um, other people in the business. I've, you know, when we talk to people, I'm like, hey, can you, if I'm going through a really tough time right now, you know, mentally, emotionally, can you help? regulate kind of the words that I'm saying <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> and help me catch these things and maybe, you know, say them back to me so I can hear how I'm sounding right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it sometimes we don't hear that. Or again, we're by ourselves all day. So nobody catch the cat's not going to say, hey, you're feeling you're saying a lot of these words right now. Are you how are you doing? Right? Like They're not going to do that. So <laughs> having those connections and community is so important in those times too. Yeah. And and saying someone's words back to them is incredibly powerful. I'm finding that in coaching conversations where I can just sort of reflect back the actual words that someone used and and they can hear them differently. They either fine tune them like, okay, I did say that, but here's how it really feels or, oh, wow. Yeah, that is, that is what I said is how it is. And I hadn't realized it was that strongly felt or whatever. And our words reflect what's going on within us, but we don't always pay much attention to our own words. We just babble them out. And like you said, having someone reflect them back can tell us a lot about what's going on in our own minds and hearts. It really can. And it's one of those things of just recognizing, again, I have agency and control over this and and I can change. And this is a good cue to me. Okay, I'm I'm feeling this internally. Now people are saying I'm saying these things externally. I I think I need to take some time and Mm -hmm. and figure something out. Yeah. Yeah. And there are always options for doing that. Um, I like to ask my guests for words that have meaning to them. And the words you shared kind of relate to this particular piece. So you said the ideal form of work feels like play, but still accomplishes something useful and valuable, joyful for you helpful to others. So tell me about these words. Where did they come into your life? What do they mean to you? Uh, like many of these things, I can't ever exactly remember and trace all the way back to how they they popped up. But the way they've really applied to me is as I look at my work, what is it? What does the work do? What does the mm-hmm. work do for me, for me and for others? And not being afraid to be, you know, it says joyful for you. It needs to accomplish something valuable and useful and it needs joy to me. And that to me speaks a lot of like, I need to get something out of this as well. Mm-hmm. It's not just for everybody else. And, and sometimes that means that the joy, the joy may be really, really small. It may be really tiny, <laughs> but there's going to be something there. And so that's, you know, when I, when I talked about our journey into pet care, now connecting on it on a much deeper level, I've spent a lot of time thinking about all the touch points that the work that we do help fill me. And does it all fill me? No, it absolutely doesn't. And that's fine. I've been able to have to admit that too. Do I like running payroll for my staff? No, but <laughs> comma, but <laughs> because I have staff, we are able to do other things that also bring me joy. I'm mm-hmm. able to help more people. I'm able to influence my staff's lives through now providing them a livelihood. That brings me joy, knowing that we are now I- impacting greater and greater amounts of people. And also realizing that the work that we do is not trivial. It is, it's useful and valuable. Yeah. And connect and real, and that's understanding that it's not just pet sitting. It's not just dog walking. That's why, what is it? It's the peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Everyone would want more peace of mind, right? Connect on it with it that way. And, and knowing that we're helping people because the people who call us, and again, it's not every time, not everybody who calls us is crying because of something terrible, but realizing that what we do allows other people to live a, a life that has more peace of mind and a lot of times guilt-free because they feel guilty having mm-hmm. to leave their special needs dogs or they feel guilty having to leave their cats behind or their guinea pigs or their we've been taking care of a lot of mini pot belly pigs recently. I don't know how we broke into that circle of <laughs> pet owners, but the pigs have started coming from the corral and we are happy to take care of them. But they, <laughs> they felt bad going, oh, I, I really want to go on this vacation, but I can't. And so when I look at the work that we do, it's still work. That's mm-hmm. important. It's still hard. We do hard things. It may feel like play at times, right? Puppy cuddles and kitty kisses. Who doesn't love those? But it's still at the end useful for the people at the end. I get something out of it and I'm helping other people. So it, it's really helped me tie in a lot of aspects about pet care. And I know many people go, really? Like dog walking, pet sitting, that? That's the thing? But it's going, 
Yeah, absolutely. And unashamedly being able to go, this accomplishes so many things. And that was a journey that I had to take because growing up, I was always focused on, well, I'm going to be a professor, I'm going to teach, I'm going to do research, science, I'm going to do all this stuff, and I'm not going to worry about the other things. And now realizing like the value brought to other people across all aspects of work is something that um, I know I didn't have a good appreciation for. And I know many people who are even in the same industry of dog walking and pet sitting don't see that appreciation for it as well. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting how our own view of the work can affect things, but also that there there are some cultural views. Like you said, just a pet sitter, like the just piece. And that's come up with a few of my clients where they talk about feeling that that people don't respect their career choices as a career. Yeah. Like this is this is my career. This isn't just my little, you know, hobby that I do sometimes because it's fun. And as a person who pursued a master's degree, you have a lot of education behind you. I have been asked a few times it, when I was younger, it, they, the question came up about my mother. Is your mother disappointed that you wasted your college education? And the first time I just laughed and said, no, but by the third time I had to call my mom and go, (laughs) well, are you disappointed that I wasted my college education by becoming a dog trainer? I hadn't seen it being a waste at all. It is not. I use every bit of my education and have continued learning as we already discussed. We're kind of learning junkies. So tell me about that perspective of you have this background and yet there can be some societal just a pet sitter. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and I'll say that um, after I got my master's, I went for my PhD. And here's a fancy word, quantitative biology. Ooh, fancy. Right? Like every, <laughs> I remember at the time saying that and being being proud of the reaction that it got from people. They're like, oh, wow, that must be really hard. Wow, that's crazy. And then I went on and I was a, a watershed and streams biologist for our conservation department. And I finally got a steady job and you know I got all that good stuff. And then to tell people that I'm leaving to go walk dogs. Right? The mm-hmm. hardest people it was to is to tell my my colleagues that were at the department mm-hmm. and then seeing the look on their faces at that time. And I, one guy, as we left, um, I was helping out with the problem that before, you know, my last couple of days and he'd said, oh, and this guy's leaving to go be a dog walker. Oh my gosh. <laughs> as, as what a waste, right? What a waste. Mm-hmm. Of and um, it's taken the family a little bit to, to, see change and, and appreciate that. But the more I talk about what we do, I'm never, it's, I'm unashamed about what we do. They have yeah. no idea the, what goes on, what is entailed, the risks. I love talking about the liabilities. That's always fun. And, <laughs> and so it's, it's a process of embracing the fact that this is just as hard. And it's not the fact that it's hard, right? It's the fact that it's different. And, and what is it doing? It's connecting with me. It's providing our family new opportunities. It's, it's a much more holistic approach than just what I do because I very recently, if we're just being honest, stopped identifying myself by what I do. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an action. I'm not a list of tasks. I'm not a, a, a list or a, a deadline. It's not what I am. I, I, there's so much more there. Um, I finding that identity, I think, is really what that is about. Colleen is going, what is my identity? How yeah. do I, how do I get connected with that? And one of the aspects, again, I keep saying this phrase, but like, I'm somebody who loves giving people peace of mind, period, right? That's something about me. So whether that's doing watershed and stream biology work, helping landowners so their their fields don't erode away, whether that's painting fences, whether that's walking dogs, whether it's that doesn't really matter so much as long as I'm connected back to things that really are part of who I am and stop trying to let other people define me or place lenses on my eyes to, so that I start mm-hmm. seeing myself differently through how they want their prescriptions to make me influence about how I feel. And that's what that part is about going, going, I, I was on a path. I'm on a different path now. Is it better, good, indifferent? I don't know. It's different. And I feel more connected. I feel more more true to myself. There are things a lot more important in the world than than titles and letters after people's names. And that's been a that's been a harder lesson for me over the last probably five years that I've really had to to work on that. I feel more connected. I feel more true to myself. Yeah. I mean, really, 
is there anything more profound than that? Like that's what we're all trying to do. Yeah, we are. We're we're trying to find that. And and that can take on many forms. And again, the with the full knowledge going, okay, that's what fed me. That was what I was for a time. But I hope I'm not the same person tomorrow as I am today. Please let that not be. And so I know that in another five years, we're going to be, or tomorrow, right? There's always that possibility where there's going to be something else that shakes me, that learn, that I learn, that I get connected with, where I realize, okay, you know what? I, I can take that on. That's something that I can do now that's maybe different than I did yesterday. And being open to that, not feeling so stuck. Because when the when the pandemic happened and everything locked down, I saw pet sitters around the world going, well, I'm, I'm a pet sitter and I can't pet sit anymore. Who am I? What do I do? Mm-hmm. What, what does this mean for me? And there was this really crisis of identity in a lot of people who had stored up their worth and value in the number of walks they did that day instead of realizing... I have inherent value, just me. You know, I am is a complete sentence. I don't need to include anything else after that. And that's enough. And yeah. and really sitting with that, I, I think, is part of that process of going, what is enough for me? Uh, and sometimes it needs to be just me. Yeah. And easier said than done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, oh all, of, all of this is easier said <laughs> than done, Colleen. <laughs> I, had a, I had a little bit of a, you know, mind meltdown when I was going through my burnout and compassion fatigue, where I recall saying to someone, but then who am I if I'm not a dog trainer? Yeah. Like if I stop being a dog trainer, who am I? Yeah. And that reality of that, we are all so much more than our job title. I knew was true for everyone else, but I wasn't entirely sure it was sure true for me, okay. you know, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a tough thing. And and particularly in the United States, that is how people lead with their, you know, who are you and what do you do? Let's do identities that way and labels that way. And learning to to live by your values and the things that fill you up, the things that connect you to your why, those are bigger and more profound and have a stronger through line than anything else. And it doesn't really matter what job you're doing because you'll still be being you, the real you within that role. But that's some life identity stuff. And I I think a lot of that starts with going, who's controlling your time, right? What does your day look like? And and of course, if if your day is full of things that you feel like you don't have control over, uh, of course, that's that's external to you, right? That becomes part of what you, because you have no control over that time, right? If you want to know Mm -hmm. anything about somebody, look at their calendar and their bank account. They'll tell you all you need to know about what they value. And we we tend to not have that that time and space to do that. And I think w- the one thing for me was going, okay, this is what I'm doing. What's one thing not that that I can do today? What What's one thing? One thing. Maybe that's, you know, go for a walk, read a page of a book because I don't have that much time, right? We're, we're <laughs> realistic. I can get through a page before something happens. But what's one thing else I could do that's not what what's on my what's on my title what's on my card and you can start to discover more things i think that process of discovery and not being afraid to try new things really helps with that what else am i what else yeah. is there to to me and into my life yeah. yeah and in that process of discovery you're going to find some things that don't work at all which is valuable information too yeah. so that time was not wasted because you learned that doesn't work for me or that didn't work for me that time but if i tweak these variables, maybe it would work for me if I did something different. So the curiosity, which is really, I think, a superpower of all pet professionals, so sort of the curiosity and willing to say, well, what's going to work in this situation? When we turn that lens toward ourselves, it can be really helpful. Yeah, I, I keep trying to convince myself that I'm a runner, right? I just, that's something that I keep trying to do because I think it's something that I should do. I'm, I, I'm not, I can do it, but it's not something that really feeds feeds me. Granted, I have the world's weakest ankles, which is funny for a dog walker. But like I, <laughs> I, I wipe out almost every time. I'm like, we're going to go for a run, uh, which is great. That's knowledge I need to know that this mm-hmm. is really not my thing. Okay, let's maybe, okay, uh, let's say we still want to get out. Let's do cycling. Maybe we just go for a walk with the kids. Like, however that's going to work, you just, 
try. And, and as adults, we get more and more uh, risk averse for many reasons, mm-hmm. right? Risk averse, you know, my, we can't heal as fast if we take the tumble with trying Taekwondo or, or we don't have the time to do long or activities. And we have more things that rely on us, my house, my kids, my car payment, all that starts to come. So risk starts to come something where we really try and control that. So what are the low risk things? Right? Reading a book, probably pretty low risk. I don't know. But mm-hmm. Switching to a different radio channel, probably pretty real, low risk. W- whatever that's going to be going, uh, what, what new, small new things. And then you, you mentioned it earlier, Colleen, about uh, about building that uh, muscle of finding that time, also building that muscle of finding new things to do. And that yeah. helps us in so many ways. Yeah. Novelty is is a really powerful reinforcer. Just something's a little different, something new, something haven't don't see all the time or do all the time and i am very prone to sameness (laughs) like i have to catch myself like i have to be deliberate about otherwise all my days would start looking the same and they'd be fine they'd be good but they wouldn't be interesting or memorable because i would be like oh yeah i actually like that again and again and again and again and again but when i make the effort to say, I'm going to try something or do something. I enjoy that even more so I can take good and make it better. Exactly. That's, that's what, that's what we look for. It's not, it's not, oh, today has to be radically different and, and sameness is bad. Predictability is wonderful. And we all want to know kind of what genuinely is going to happen tomorrow. That gives us a piece of, (laughs) peace of mind. Uh, But just going, what if I tried one new thing today? And I think that just starting there and because, you know, in school, we encourage kids to kids to try, try all the sports, try all the instruments, try all the subjects, try all the studying things, you know, figure, let's figure that out. But as adults, again, we kind of lose that aspect and where it stops becoming a safe to try big things. And so let's try little things. And, you know, the, the podcast was something that Megan and I did where we were like, no, I have no background in editing audio, nothing. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> or, or expanding a business, offering a new service going or tweaking a service slightly. The, the newness gives us feedback into the world around us, right? It's like, I think of it a lot of like cave organisms in where they, they can only sense through vibrations. And sometimes the mm-hmm. only way they get vibrations back in aquatic fields is to send out vibrations, which is super risky because what if there's something bigger out there? But you'd never know until you did something to get that feedback back into how I'm doing, what's the world telling me about some things so I can make adjustments if I need to. Yeah, that's a really powerful. My husband calls those pings. He says, going to send out a ping. <laughs> Apparently left over from his Navy days. <laughs> um, so if you were going to give pet professionals all, of all types, including pet sitters, one piece of advice to just make their lives just a smidge easier, what would it be? Hmm. I would say to, to get connected community is really important, right? Um, I, I'm mm-hmm. going to take this and twist a little bit and say, yes, it's important to be connected to other dog walkers, pet sitters, pet care professionals in your world. Get connected to a broader business community. Speaking of sending out pings, um, th- because when you talk to somebody who is in operations, who is in financial markets, who is in HR, who is in all these other fields, you get back a ton of information into your life that you had no idea existed. This happened to me. Um, there's a, a community called um, One Million Cups. It's a, I'll make sure and give you that link. It's a free business co- community where people can come together and they share usually once a week over some coffee. They have somebody present and talk about their business. And it's like, Heart like like business specific of like here are my financials here's how I make money here's a business plan let's go and then people tell you information back. The first time I did that, some guy came up to me. He had spent his entire life in operations management for a large shipping company, and he was like, "Sounds like you have an operations nightmare in your business." <laughs> and I went, "I'm sorry, what?" <laughs> <laughs> and he was using terms that I had no idea, but all of a sudden it was so helpful. And it, it really sent back an avalanche of information back into me to go, wow, like I, these are a lot of actionable stuff. So getting connected to people for many, I think understanding the reason you're getting connected with people is important going, I need my community that's going to feed me emotionally, feed me, um, you know, physically, if I'm doing running, you know, my runner's club, uh, my family is going to be another community. Uh, I have my business community of pet sitters who I can commiserate. We can talk about kind of our struggles and, and, and make sure we're not alone. I have a broader business community 
community so I can get actually a load of information to help me and my business be better. That's something that we don't do a lot because, importantly, is because we don't view ourselves as legitimate businesses. So why would I go to a business community? Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? What are they going to say? What are they going to do? Well, I'll tell you what, they'll have a better appreciation for you when in your business and how what you do, you'll be shocked the number of mouths hit the floor when you tell them what you do. And then your mouth will hit the floor when they tell you how to be better. And it'll, (laughs) it really, it really helps a lot. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it helps a lot. That's awesome. Thank you. So if people want to learn more about you and your work, how could they do that? Uh, the podcast is Pet Sitter Confessional, and they can go to PetSitterConfessional.com uh, to check out all of our past episodes. Uh, they can uh, get connected with us on Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, we are on Twitter for some reason, uh, <laughs> or even or even YouTube to see past stuff as well. Uh, it is, we're just Pet Sitter Confessional everywhere. Awesome. Thank you. And my last question is, if you had one wish for all pet professionals, what would it be? A little bit more time in their day. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today, Colin. It was really fun talking to you. Yeah, Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for listening to Unleashed at Work and Home. I invite you to come learn more at ColleenPilar.com, where you can be steady, be strong, and be long.